50% of our memory is correct. 50%. But we feel that everything we remember is 100% accurate. Most things in science we know because of someone's sufferings, because of what someone had to go through that we eventually learned about the body. We know a lot about memory thanks to Henry Molaison. In recent decades, scientists have made great advances in understanding how and where the human brain makes and stores memories, a key part of forming our identities. A man who unwittingly helped them do it, Henry Molison, who underwent a lobotomy in 1953, intended to relieve his epileptic seizures. The doctors took out his hippocampus and his amygdala and noticed no behavioral changes besides the fact that he couldn't form or retrieve recent memories. So this all has to deal with your body, and this all has to deal with the pain you're experiencing. Hi, my name's Kurt, I'm a physical therapist. And this is part three, part three of a pain series that I'm going through, through this daily video journey. So we first have to understand that there are different types of memory. This whole video is trying to just simplify things, and we're taking some creative liberties just to simplify it. You have your motor habits, your factual knowledge, and your experiential moments. AKA, you'll always remember how to ride a bike. You'll remember when you were born and who was the president in 1970. And then everything that you've lived through. I will always remember how to ride a bike. I might even remember when I even learned to ride a bike, facts. But do I remember with 100% accuracy that experience of that day of when I learned how to ride a bike. I have glimpses of it. I think it was a blue bike. I think it was my neighbor that taught me. I don't exactly, I don't know. But I have this memory of it. But I, I, I of course, I don't know with 100% accuracy. But I can know with 100% accuracy that I know how to ride a bike. And most likely, you know when you learned how to ride a bike. A little snippet of the conclusion of the video is your pain experience has gone from an ex experiential moment, an experiential memory, into a factual memory. And this is thanks to story and emotion. So memory is cued by senses. You know all the senses, visual, auditory, olfactory, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, etc. You know those. All these things are sensing in the world, sending this sensory stimulus to my brain and my brain uses context to determine what's happening. Essentially, everything your body does is one of two things. It senses or it moves. Sensory and motor. Sensory goes into the brain, motor goes out of the brain. So each sense has a different part of the brain that it talks to, and then that part communicates with the center part of the brain to help your body prepare, prepare for movement. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? And all the other senses are going to my brain to say, like, is there a threat? Am I moving? And for efficiency and survival reasons, your brain then also stores that sensory adaptation and that motor habit in your hippocampus so that when you need to access that skill or memory again, it can quickly access it. Notice if you follow the past two days, Prepare for movement. Prepare is a very, very loaded word. Every ex part one, every experience you've had prior is going to influence your preparation. The environment that you're in is going to influence your preparation because of memory. And pain creates a really strong memory. Specifically, it forms a very strong memory. This is all in your hippocampus. Just to think a hippo is camping for us to protect us. Hippos are scary. They're just camping there, ready for us to protect us in case something threatening happens. In a little snippet, there's also Amy who dug us a hole because she, 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 she's scared. Your amygdala. So it's the, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the common understanding to say, do you think you remember everything from your childhood? Of course not. No, what's the point of that? What's the point of remembering everything that happened on July 1st, 1985. What's the point of remembering of September 20th, 2005? What's the point? There's no point. 
unless you had a very strong positive or negative experience that forced your body to remember that date and time and what happened. For majority of us, what, what part of life do you typically remember the most? For majority of people, it's your teens to your mid to late 20s. It's kind of obvious. So many momentous occasions happen there. Life-changing moments. Found your first love, got your first job, graduated college, had a bad accident. So many things happen because you're, 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 you're supposed to explore. You're supposed to challenge. And every year has something new that it's going to offer you. That's the part of growing up. You remember all these things because there are a lot of positive and negative, strong memories. It kick-started what you feel your role is based on your experiences. So we can identify that these years are momentous, but what makes them momentous? Could it just be that a lot of things happened? Could it just be that you're doing a lot of things? Could it just be that you had a lot of feelings and a lot of emotions? I want you to take a look at these faces. What one do you remember most? There's 10. What one do you remember most? It's likely number seven. Number seven was the one that had the strongest emotion, the most visceral feeling that we can all relate with. It instantly created a stronger memory for you. Your, your emotions are your amygdala. Think Amy dug a hole. And your amygdala is really close to your hippocampus in your brain. So those emotions that you see on those faces create a strong memory in your hippocampus so that you can recall it faster with more certainty. What, what this means is when you see or feel or sense a certain emotion in a certain experience, it upregulates your hippocampus. Upregulation just turns it on more, activates it stronger. This is like so important. So important because emotions, emotions create that deep memory. A little snippet into the conclusion again for you. It's pretty emotional seeing the imaging. It's pretty emotional going through pain. It's pretty emotional the trauma that you've been through. It's pretty emotional when the doctor dismisses your pain. It's pretty emotional when you find answers. It's pretty emotional when you get better. It's pretty emotional when you get worse again. It's pretty emotional when you get a bad diagnosis. Strong, 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 strong memories. So we, we've highlighted emotion creates a strong memory. The second key to a strong memory is story. Such an ambiguous term. So let's do another exercise. <laughs> uh, House of Dragons just came out. Tell me the story of Jon Snow. Tell me the story of Daenerys Targaryen. Everything. Tell me the story of Frodo Baggins. Tell me the story of Bilbo Baggins. Now, tell me the story of the quadratic equation. Just tell me the quadratic equation. One is like a one hour monologue that you could tell me about all these characters that we've watched. <laughs> one is a one, one minute conversation about the square root of whatever. <laughs> Why can you remember the complicated story, but not the simple equation? This is for all the people who aren't in mathematics. <laughs> you might use time and recency bias to downplay the fact that you know Game of Thrones faster and Lord of the Rings more accurately than you do high school algebra. So tell me the story of Simba, Mufasa. Tell me the story of these Disney movies that we watched in VHS 20 years ago. It's not time, it's story. When we can narrate through a pathway, we have little checkpoints that upregulate the story. So you pair story with emotions, boom, you have a really strong memory. Here, let's do another exercise. Memorize these numbers. One, two, three, 27, 93, 52, 47, six, zero. Pretty easy, just a couple numbers. Now memorize this story. You have a man and a woman sitting on a bench. They just got coffee. The man's wearing a blue plaid shirt. The woman's wearing a nice yellow sweater. They're talking, conversing. It kind of, they're, they're, they're kind of looks like they're friends. They might be on a date. 
She's carrying some pink flowers. Maybe they just went to the farmer's market on a date and they got some coffee and they're just chatting on a bench. There's this little awkward chemistry between them and you can't really understand. Are they vibing? Are they not vibing? <laughs> what were those numbers again? I don't remember. One, two, three, 27, 56. I don't know. I don't know. Now we can deepen these memories by seeing the numbers. Here they are again. Memorize them. I think I got them. Now watch these two people talk. Do you think they're a couple? Do you think they're on a date? What, what do you think? I, I can't, I can't tell. <laughs> I, I already forgot the numbers. One, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three, 27, 56, I don't know. But I have ingrained my memory, these two people. One has a story, one are just factual numbers. Now a little bit more complicated is if you can associate a new stimulus with an old memory, plus you see it, with emotions and it has a story, you have an even stronger memory. These old memories could be your mom having trouble getting out of bed because of her disc herniation. These old memories could be the ACL tear you had when you were 18, when you were playing soccer or basketball and you tore your ACL. And now you have knee pain as a 50 year old, as a 35 year old. These old memories could be seeing a, seeing a traumatic injury on TV and now you're scared to go play high hockey because you don't want to, that to happen to you. These are old memories with new stimulus that get connected in our brain and they become your own memory, your own story. This is why I always will say your body's not fragile and age does not equal pain. Pain is almost always a response from a new stimulus that is triggering an old memory that your body freaks out about. We've been conditioned to think I slow down at age 30 I get stiff and painful at 50, and then I'm just old and crippled at 70. Anything, anything, what your doctor says, what you read on Google, what your friends say, anything that confirms that conditioned bias will already create a strong memory. Again, pair that with story and emotions, which we'll talk about further, you get a stronger, stronger, stronger memory. So this, this pain could be deepened by seeing an MRI. This pain could be deepened by how the doctor communicates, deepened what you read online on Dr. Google or Reddit or YouTube. This pain could be deepened by the facts that you read on WebMD and tell yourself a story based on what your parents went through or what your friends went through. Pain deepened with how this injury forces you to change jobs or give up hobbies, not see your friends anymore, to use your life savings on doctor bills. Man, that's just a lot of amygdala talking. Amy's in her little hole yelling out, saying, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, come in the hole with me, I'm scared. So if I, if I try to get some clarity, I'm saying these, these emotional memories, these painful memories create stronger memories. But that does not mean they last as long or as well as other memories. The biggest key is emotional memories, what are called light bulb memories, deteriorate at the same rate with just everyday memories. The only thing that changes is your confidence in believing them, your confidence in that they are accurate. So although it's deteriorating at the same rate, you feel like you have a stronger memory of what happened to your injury 20 years ago than what you did yesterday and what you ate for breakfast this morning. AKA, you believe them longer and stronger. We briefly talked about yesterday, the body cares about efficiency, whatever is the most efficient thing to do. So I'm going to take in all this new stimulus in a prior environment that you have experience in. It's going to take your prior experience to condition your brain to say, you're on a basketball court, this is what happened. It uses past experiences and new facts that you've learned and your current routines fill in the blanks of when it's trying to recall a memory. The importance of this is not the recollection, but the formation. When you're trying to recall a memory, what matters most is your confidence in that memory. Because your confidence in that memory is going to drive how strongly you're going to act on that memory. So let's start to, start to bring this home. 
You have pain in your back. WebMD says it's a disc herniation. You try PT, which likely confirms that a disc herniation. You start to get worse because disc herniations suck. I'm sorry. You go to the doctor, the surgeon, you get an MRI, you see that bulge going into your scary little spinal cord. The doctor talks about surgery versus not surgery versus losing control of your feet versus losing control of your bladder versus debilitating pain versus being addicted to pain meds. You hear about other people's disc herniations, especially when it's your parents or close relatives or friends. You read further facts about disc herniations. You go on Reddit and YouTube and you learn all about disc herniations. And in this advertising world that we're trying to hyperbolize things for you, we're gonna make it sound a lot worse than it is because I want you to buy my products. This isn't even taking into account the physical pain that you're feeling, how it's affecting your job and your sleep and your ability to be a parent, things that you take pride in. It's forcing you to give up playing basketball and forcing you to give up it hurts with sitting, so it's forcing you to give up, forcing you to give up driving as long as you like to, or riding your bike, or things that you enjoy. Add in the fact that doctors are overwhelmed and impacted, so they're dismissive of pain, and then we know we have an opioid epidemic, so you're not getting the pain meds that you think you need. And there's this whole just dismissal of your pain experience, saying that it's in your head and you're going crazy by our doctor. It's just, boom. You have such a strong pain memory that you feel like you have to fight for. So stinking strong. It literally, it literally becomes you. All that you think about, it drives every decision that you make. All of this is shaped by your experiences. Everything you've been through from kid to adulthood shaped how you make decisions, what you focus on. These are all memories, and it's forever ingrained in your memory, thanks to your amygdala, with environment or movement or place. Place roots the memory and history in your brain. You're going to remember the place first, and then you might remember what you're doing, and then you might remember what's happening, but it always starts, it's rooted in the environment. So. So memory is this complicated thing that I've tried to take some liberties to help you understand how it associates with pain, how it associates with your prior experiences in chapter one, how it associates with place, your environment, your context. Chapter two, what I really want you to start to understand is memory can be shaped even after it's formed. The only way to do that is to be to understand that things that we confidently can remember may not be as accurate as we think they are. So therefore, there's the opportunity to change. The whole if-then statements that we learned. If it's true that your memory can be shaped by emotions and story and can also be inaccurate, but your confidence in them will always be strong, then we have the opportunity to create a new memory in the same environment because we understand that it's possible that we've been shaped by negative story and negative emotions. I truly believe your body can heal from anything. I also truly believe that you're the only one that can do that. When you recognize that when you see things, it creates a stronger memory. When you hear stories, it creates a stronger memory. When people talk to you and dismiss you and don't see you, it creates a stronger memory. But the strength of that memory is almost always not correlated to the intensity of your injury, to the severity of your injury. But what's limiting you is the strength of that memory. That's plenty. Yeah, that's good. Turn the air back on. Thanks for joining me today. Appreciate you all. I'll see you tomorrow.